Hi, everybody, and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. This is our second try at uh, testing to get this up and running so that people can enjoy this talk. We have five by five. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Really looking forward to this talk by Hannah Sham Lu, which will be beginning in about 10 minutes from now. It's 8.50 a.m. Pacific time, and this program will begin in 10 minutes at the top of the hour, at high noon, local time. So if you're watching this in replay, you don't have to hang out for the first 10 minutes. You can fast forward uh, to the beginning of the talk. The format of this is uh, we have a room full of uh, people here in the geology department, a few town folk as well, uh, all here to listen to a live lecture by our guest, Hannah. Shamlu, I want to make sure that her microphone is functional, but I think I solved it, and I'm so glad to see uh, that we have five by five. So I guess the other live stream might still be there or something. If, if some of you have both of those open, you can go back and tell them that th this one appears to be functional. Testing. Let's go for it, Hannah. Okay. Hey, testing, oh, testing. my blood pressure. Oh, Ooh, boy. Oh, boy. So, uh, is uh, is <laughs> Hannah uh, uh, audible to you as Can well? Can you hear my mic? Testing, testing, Hannah's mic. Asking if you can hear Anna. Can Both are five by me? five. Five by five. Uh, could you type Hannah five by five, please? Testing, testing, Hannah's mic. So, how's that wire feel? I think it's fine. Yeah, I don't even you know got, it's you got, you got shoulders. I can still do my you got, you know, martial arts. Exactly. You got your thumb. Are you going to go thumb or forefinger? I'm usually forefinger. You're, you're, you know you're a pointer saying? person. Got to be pointer. And there's your... There's my timer. Okay. So I don't Good. go over. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, God. I need some water. I just get cotton mouth when things aren't going well. <laughs> uh, get a little clammy. <laughs> yeah. I'll say a couple more words. What's Double up? check one more time. We'll just keep you on if you don't okay. mind. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, your parents. So nice. I know. Isn't that sweet? They're here. They're Ellensburg folk now. <laughs> Ain't no going back now. I'm just kidding. Come on. <laughs> I'll swing you around so that you can see half the room in just a second, but the format of this is uh, we'll start at the top of the hour. I'll do a few announcements. Uh, there's some class members that need to be apprised of X, Y, and Z. Just always we'll do the to talk. You. There'll be some live Q and A I with the you. room, and then thank you. I doubt there'll be much live Q&A directly with Hannah. I'm sorry, but she'll probably be dealing with a bunch of people after the lecture. But we can we can visit a little bit after the lecture as well. We have uh, 86 watching is, uh, right now. Is that true? And I'm asking one more time uh, for five by five, and we'll just five by five, Hannah, or are yeah. You? We'll try one more time. Testing, so testing, Hannah's mic. Five by five. Yes or no. So are you, uh, so the role of this, you're going to cut yourself off at a certain yeah, point? Yeah, otherwise I'll just stand up here and talk all freaking day. <laughs> so Which wouldn't be bad. Keep the pace, keep the pace. It wouldn't be bad. <laughs> so what? what's the magic number? Are you Are you wanting to like be done? At no more or? than 50 minutes. Okay. Usually, I, I think 45 is a beautiful number, but I don't always make that, so. Oh, it's good. Okay. I don't want to drone on for an hour. Oh, God, look at this crowd. I know. You are popular. Good. Oh, this is the huge. Ooh. This is the huge. Hey. <laughs> I'm bummed you couldn't make I'll buy it. Five for to both. Yeah, like you okay. Swing you around. So Thank you for joining us. Maybe I scared someone the first day when I talked about. Hey, Joe. What did I talk about? I don't know. Maybe someone got scared and they'll drop. Yeah, hey, Joe. I know. I was bummed to not see you day one. Yeah. Yeah. 
Hey. Well, I appreciate your attention. How are you, Gabe? Thanks for coming. You can still come anytime you'd like. It is. I yeah. hope you get a chance to meet some of the yeah. folks. So come when you uh, want. Some of the grand students. Good. Oh, are you? Good. Oh, Abby. Okay. I like Abby a lot. Marcus, thank you for repping. I appreciate that. She said, I was like, I didn't want you to do that, but if you I do. Stay off camera, you stay on this side of the room. If you we are live on YouTube, so add to the uh, visual okay. celebration. <laughs> by all means. It is right now, yeah. yeah. You were just being recorded. I should have told you that. Yes. So I got a new one for 7 a.m. the next day. That one was canceled. I got a new one for noon that day. That one was canceled. Oh, do not envy you, huh? What? Too late to put an order Hey, how's it going? Oh, that's well, your spot, We can spot, do another order. It? If there's a big mass, we can order more. Yeah. I was delayed. Well, I, I thought of you when I set up this, some of this stuff right here. I'm like, wow, I wonder if she's going to be here again. Iowa, I would have been there 11 hours sooner. Oh, you've been watching? Good. Oh, my God. That's... No. No. You made it back, though. I hung around here, yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. I was like, can I move? You can move. You can move. I've heard so much about you, and I think we've emailed before. Hey guys, it's so nice to meet you. Well, Thanks for coming. It. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're a volcano enthusiast, right? <laughs> Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Hi, you guys. Thank you for filling out the front of the room. It's so great. Oh, this is so exciting to have you all back. This is a party. This squad. Johnny boy. Hi. How are you? I'm all right. How are Good. you? It's so nice to see Good. the rocks and minerals people. Oh, well, switching it up. Not not your usual salad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Very Good. Thank you. That's my true nickname, and I like when people honor it. <laughs> not yet. I'll take his lead on whatever. Hey, Miss Nick. How are you? Dr. Nick. Did, uh, you're great. You she went up, got your exam. Yeah. You feeling good about it? Yeah, I, I feel indicated for the late night. <laughs> Not a lot of details, but damn it, I made it pretty. There you go. Very good. Hey, you guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Oh, you guys. Have you seen each other since you've been back, or this is it? We have classes. We have class. Okay. Okay. Your sweater is yes. very funny. Oh, <laughs> Your sweater is very funny. Thank you. I feel like I relate to that. I feel like small. coming up in front again. No, I don't. Don't even tell them about it. We're just happy to be here. Mm. That's our deal. And my dad and my stepmom. Okay. George Washington. Okay. Everyone yeah, understands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I can acknowledge that you're helping yeah. us out again. That's me too. About. I have three boxes here. So a crowd. Awesome. Good crowd. Good job. Oh we needed three. No, we're fine. Hi. Welcome back. Thank you. Both of you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this is exciting. Yeah. Can't, it's, it's very surreal. Uh, yeah, it feels like it was a fever dream living here for two years, yes. doing a master's, and then yes. coming back and everything's like mostly familiar, but kind of unlocking memories as we go. Yeah. And a lot of faces that are not familiar. Yeah, yeah. Also exciting. Good. Yeah. Well, let's get caught up. Yeah. Do you want to announce something, or should I announce something? I um, mean, you can just say if you haven't signed the consent form. I'm right here. Even if they're off camera, they need to sign something. No. No. Just the just the, this half of the way. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like the energy. You want to meet the president? I did. I just said hi. Yeah. Can you just remind three or four and five four students to come check in with me? Sure. Okay. I've got most people, but I don't know everyone's face yet. Okay. We can do that. Good turnout. 
Good turnout. <laughs> Thanks for making time to join us today. If I had the opportunity, I'd do this all day long, every day. <laughs> I'm to be here. <laughs> well, I'm particularly excited about her, so yeah. I'm glad you're getting a chance yeah. to hear her. Okay. All right. Let's do this. You can still hear me, right? You're going to assume yes. Can I do one more request? The room is hushing now because I'm talking to you. Sorry. <laughs> just keep. I've just got to do one more quick test to make sure that we're functional with both of our microphones. Hannah 5x5, five five, Nick Fina 5x5, five five, both of those are okay. But we're about to start. Just need to double check. Thank you. You ready? Okay. Hi, Megan. Well, welcome, everybody. I guess I didn't have to hush you up. You hushed uh, by yourselves, uh, so way to go. Good job by you. Happy New Year. Welcome back. Give yourself a round of applause for coming. We got a full room, and I'm not sure we ever had that in the fall. So uh, if you're a, a new person joining us, I hope you'll feel comfortable and want to come back again. We have a full slate of talks that Hannah and I have put together for the department this winter quarter. Let me give you a quick rundown. Uh, today, Friday, January 6th, Hannah Shamlu. Nothing next Friday, although if a bunch of you come talk to me and you say, hey, can we just do some refreshments anyway since we're not having a talk next Friday? Be happy to do that. Um, before I forget, you notice there was Vinman's Bakery yet again. Jeff from Vinman's Bakery, round of applause, please. <laughs> He continues to support us. I hope we're continuing to support the bakery just a few steps away. So the next of these Friday at noon talks will be Friday, January 20th, Darcy Snowden from upstairs, from, from heaven, from the physics department. <laughs> we'll talk about Artemis Rhodes using NASA's mission back to the moon to inspire and motivate the next generation. Oof. So, um, you know, these, this is a kind of a different, a departure from other uh, seminars that we've had in the past, instead of all the guest speakers coming from elsewhere, we want to show off who we have here, not only in this building, but on campus. And it's winter and it's tough to get people over the past and everything else. So there'll be a mixture on purpose of central employees, as well as uh, some guests coming in on occasion. Speaking of local talent, Lisa Ely and Ann Egger together will give a talk on Friday, February 10th. 200 Years of Women in the Field, Contributions and Controversy in Geology. Friday, February 24th, we will have uh, Tyler Schleider from Tri-Cities in the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Comparing whole rock and plagioclase host, hosted zircon records from the world's youngest super eruption. And then finally, on Friday, March 3rd, maybe the last Friday of the court. No, that's not true. The first Friday in March, John Schellenberger, uh, who is the CW Director of uh, Native American Studies, will be driving up from Toppenish to give a talk, Understanding Indigenous Landscapes on the Columbia Plateau. So plenty, plenty happening this winter. A couple quick announcements and we get to our talk. Uh, Bree McGinnis, Department Chair, reminds you that if you're on this half of the room and you're on camera, and if you have not done the paperwork last quarter, you need to see her for some paperwork this quarter. Is that true? Or even we need to renew paperwork? No, just if you haven't done the paperwork to kind of provide permission for us to get you on camera live, then Bree is your gal standing right there in the back of the room if you don't know her. Walter's going to stand up briefly. If you don't know Walter Zaliga, he's teaching Geology 304-504 this fall, this winter. And if you don't know him and he's, and you are taking 304 and have not checked in with him, 
He doesn't know all of your faces yet, so please visit with Walter after class. Uh, do you know me? Doesn't have to come down and say hi. Ah, if you do know Walter, Aww. just go up and visit with him. Okay, <laughs> terrific. Without further ado, thank you for joining us. Here's a very brief introduction of our speaker. Right before the world shut down, February of 2020, we were interviewing candidates for a new Igneous Petrology professor, and Hannah Shamlu, our speaker today, gave a dynamite talk, and we hired her, and here she is. Uh, like, we, she accepted the job, the world shut down, the world opens up, and she's here. So it's been great. We're very excited about her uh, future as well as her present, and I hope you enjoy this talk that is entitled Diffusion in Magma and Crystals, Tracking the Timing of Eruption Initiation. Please help me welcome Hannah Shamlu. <laughs> Well, thank you, Nick, for that introduction. And thank you all for joining. I love seeing this whole room. The energy is just intoxicating. Like Nick said, the last time I addressed the department as a whole, I was interviewing for this job. <laughs> so I'm standing up here feeling very grateful and very excited to be a part of this community. So the theme of our talk today is walking you guys through the big picture questions my research attempts to address and specifically using diffusion in magma and crystals in order to track the timing of eruption initiation at a variety of volcanoes around the world. So before we get into volcanic eruptions, of course, we need to understand what's going on beneath the volcano. So I'm asking a question here, why do we care about magma? Well, the obvious answer is that magma is the prerequisite, oh, I'm supposed to be using this cursor too, <laughs> the prerequisite to a volcanic eruption. And we can actually learn a ton from not only magmatic processes, but volcanic processes, such as how a planet evolves through time. So imagine when a volcano erupts, it's contributing to planetary crust that we can live on. When it emits gas, that can contribute to atmospheres and influence life. And then also think about when a volcano erupts at its core, it's really an expression of heat. So we're learning about heat budgets within planetary bodies. The reason I'm showing Jupiter's moon Io and Olympus Mons on Mars is just a reminder that volcanoes are not unique to Earth. They're littered throughout the solar system. Yes, we care about them more on Earth because we live here, but we can learn a ton from solar system volcanoes too. Now, a more obvious reason as to why this topic is important and worth our time, of course, is because when volcanoes do erupt, they can be very hazardous and destructive. So I'm showing, although I'm, I'm in the way here. Oh, let me get it out. That's okay. I'm showing not only very recent volcanic eruptions, but eruptions that received a lot of media attention. So specifically, Kilauea 2018, Sorry, I should be doing this. <laughs> Kilauea 2018, which is kind of old news now that Mauna Loa has erupted just last year. The Fakati Island eruption in New Zealand in 2019, which was very devastating because maybe you guys know that there was a tour happening on that island when it decided to erupt, which resulted in 22 lives lost, unfortunately. And then the Hunga Tonga eruption, which happened in the Pacific Ocean, but still had really far reaching effects. So, of course, we want to understand these systems so we can better prepare for future eruptions. Now, the outstanding questions in the field of volcanology and igneous petrology is what has to happen down here in the magma chamber beneath the volcano in order for magma to erupt? So, in other words, how can we put what's happening down here in context of what we're, abs what we're actually allowed to observe on the surface with our monitoring tools. So when magma does move through the crust on its way to erupt to the surface, it's usually accompanied by some signal of unrest, whether that be an earthquake, so ground shaking, whether that be deformation of the volcano, so swelling and contracting, or whether that be gas release. Now, for well-monitored volcanoes, which is definitely not every volcano, Right? Volcanoes are only monitored when they, we have resources, when they're accessible, when we have funding. But if a volcano is lucky enough to be monitored, then these signals can give us 
interpretable signals within the hours to months prior to an eruption. But the question remains, what's happening down here? And is it within the time resolution of our monitoring tools? So our big picture questions are, what magmatic processes initiate volcanic eruptions? And how long do these processes take? Can we capture what's happening down here within the resolution of our tools on the surface? Now, when magma does erupt, it doesn't always erupt, but when it does, we've learned that it can erupt in a variety of ways. And if you've taken any of my volcanoes class, you have seen this slide, so bear with me for the students in the audience. So the first personality we like to think of as incessant eruption. So this is continuous burping, for example, Stromboli in Italy. It's been continuously burping since the 1930s. And relatively speaking, these are tame events. So they do pose threat to human life, but this volcano is well monitored and these eruptions are really localized. So it's relatively tame. The second personality we could call tranquil effusion. So these are our stream-like tranquil because they're kind of chill. These are our low viscosity lava flows. Again, relatively low hazard, but of course we know Kilauea can consume a landscape. And then on the very right here is my personal favorite, paroxysms with long repose. So these are extreme end member, catastrophic, sometimes super voluminous, so sometimes they spew a ton of material. But the long repose is referring to the fact that they don't happen very frequently. So we don't know a whole lot about them. In fact, humans have not, in our lifetime and our ancestors' lifetime, have not witnessed an eruption like this. This is not a Yellowstone eruption. This is actually Cordon Calle in Chile. But Yellowstone's a good example of a paroxysm. So this is a compelling framework to ask those two main questions. What drives a volcano to erupt like this, and how long does it take? Now, if I haven't articulated to you enough why explosive volcanism, while infrequent, is still important to understand, I'm gonna bring it back to the Hungatanga eruption in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that just happened one year ago. And it created a, an eruption plume that was 300 miles across and it created a tsunami that was felt all the way in our home state of Washington. And it was the largest eruption the world has seen in three decades. So significant event, luckily remote, but still had far reaching effects. Now, the first portion of this talk is me just walking us through some fundamental concepts. So we're all on the same page. So when, I want you guys to know when we say magma chamber, what do we mean? So maybe your head, when I say magma chamber, goes to a picture like this, which is a large cauldron of homogenous, liquid, bubbling magma, a behemoth that lives under the crust. So this, for example, is a picture from the internet I took of an artist's interpretation of what magma would look like beneath Yellowstone. Now we've learned it's not this simple. Through years of geophysical evidence, geochemical evidence, we've learned that magma is stored in what we call a mush system, so something far more complex than a homogenous body of liquid. Now, allow me to walk you through the anatomy of this mush system. So for one, this is a schematic I've taken from Kathy Cashman's paper. We're extending from the mantle all the way to the surface. And the first thing you might notice is these melt-dominated pods here. And of course, I'm showing 2D but try in your mind's eye to think in 3D. These things are interconnected and complicated and their geometry is usually sill-like, but can be much more complex. But these melt-dominated pods are nestled in what we call mush. And what we mean by that is this magma that has cooled and actually has become very crystalline rich. So we like to think of our mush the same way we think of a slushy. So in your mind, a slushy is part ice and it's part juice, so solid and liquid. Now imagine if our slushy is so icy, it's rigid, it's locked. If we put a straw in that really, really icy slushy, we won't be able to mobilize the slushy and enjoy it. What has to happen is something needs to perturb our slushy, either we're jamming the straw in the slushy as you do to make things more juicy, 
or we increase temperature, let the slushy become a little more melted, then we can mobilize our slushy through the straw and drink it. Same exact thing is true for our magma mush. It's mostly locked in crystalline, so something needs to seriously perturb the system in order for magma to erupt to the surface. I'll also point out that towards the top of this schematic, we have more evolved magma. So what that means, it's rich in silica. This is the part of the story I am excited about because often these silicic magmas lead to really explosive style eruptions. So this shallowly stored magma systems is where my framework lies. Now something so exciting about where our field has gone in the past few decades is that we can think about these super large scale events by studying things on the micro scale, so atomic scale. So what I mean by that is when magma does erupt from a magma chamber, it will result in volcanic rock on the surface. And when within that volcanic rock, we expect to find a volcanic crystal. Now, if we slice this thing open, we hope that we would find what we call crystal zones. And these crystal zones are very similar to the way we think of tree rings, where each zone is a different period of growth in that crystal's life. The same is true for a tree ring, where each ring represents a different growth period, and also it's recording conditions in which that tree grew in the forest. It's, it's uh, marking precipitation, it has a time component, it has temperature. Same is true for our crystal. It's tracking changes in the magma system. And if we were to look on the atomic scale of this crystal, we would see changes in its chemistry along that boundary. Another thing I'll point out is that the rim of our crystal is most important to us because we're curious about the events that are happening right before eruption. So the rim is the last recorded event prior to this crystal leaving our magma. So in the past few decades, we've had a lot of advancements, not only in people doing experimental petrology, but the precision of our analytical tools has improved and our modeling power has increased. So diffusion chronometry, which is not entirely new, the metamorphic community has been using this for a while, we are just slow to the party, has basically this technique relies on elements moving in a crystal or a liquid. So here I'm showing a very simple cartoon of a atomic view of elements situated in a crystalline solid. And each yellow blob, you can imagine, is a single atom vibrating. That's why it looks kind of crazy. Now, if we take a transect through one of these lines, we would see that these atoms are sitting in what we call energy wells or crystal sites. And they're sitting there and they're vibrating, but given enough thermal energy, this atom can actually vibrate so much that it will jump from one site to the next. And this act of jumping is what we call diffusion. What's better is if we know the rate at which this jumping occurs, we can now relate time, that's what we care about, right? Time, to the distribution of certain elements in a crystal or melt. Now to drive this home even more in the context of a crystal, imagine, this is again a very simplified cartoon, where we have a crystal sitting in the middle of a magma. Now imagine it's growing from a homogeneous magma with some composition. And if we were to take a transect across that crystal, that's what these little dots represent, individual analysis of the chemistry across the crystal, we would expect a concentration profile that's relatively constant, right? There's no changes being recorded in our homogeneous crystal. But now imagine something changes our magma composition. We haven't specified what, but something has changed the magma composition followed by a new period of growth. So what our profile now looks like is our rim composition is reflecting new magma and the core composition is reflecting old magma. And we have this really sharp boundary between rim and core. Now let's say that crystal is sitting at magmatic temperatures, which by the way are very hot, <laughs> so we know atoms are going to diffuse because they have thermal energy. 
So what's going to happen is our once sharp boundaries are going to blur or become fuzzy as these atoms diffuse across these boundaries, trying to achieve some sort of chemical equilibrium. This is just what nature does. So our once sharp profile that I'm showing by this black dashed line has relaxed in shape. That is good news for us because if we assume that our crystal core and rim boundary was sharp, we can actually calculate how much time did it take for this profile to relax to make this shape. And the way we do this is we use a differential equation or fixed second law that if you solve this equation with known boundary conditions, it relates time, so that's what we care about, the rate at which a specific element moves through a crystal at known temperature, temperature is very, very important here, to the shape of the profile. So this is, these are all the key ingredients that we need to start unlock, unlocking some of these stories. Now you can think of diffusion the same way as when we make a cup of tea. I'm always bringing it back to beverages. So initially, we have a really sharp boundary between tea water and normal water, but given time and at high temperature, our tea will homogenize as atoms diffuse and at high temperature and given some time. So diffusion happens everywhere. We're just exploiting it in a tiny little crystal. Okay, so you guys are all up to speed on how diffusion chronometry works, but I wanna make sure that we both understand the two most important parts of this method. Yes, we will get a time scale from the shape of this gradient, but what often people forget is we first need to establish context of what that chemical gradient represents, what process actually produced that chemical gradient. This is how we're gonna get a meaningful result. All right, that was a lot of background. I promise I'm gonna show you some science now. So we're gonna do two case studies today. First, we're gonna talk about using diffusion chronometry at a super eruption. And then second, we're gonna move on to an explosive eruption that's on a much smaller scale, but still significant. And we're gonna keep these two questions in mind. What processes occur to initiate an eruption and how long does this take? And to make things even more interesting, I'm gonna show you an example of how we use crystal diffusion chronometry and also melt diffusion chronometry. Okay, so number one, when you hear the word super eruption, perhaps your mind goes to Yellowstone Caldera here in the United States, at least my mind does. So I'm showing a picture taken from within the park and you'll notice it's just beautiful, serene landscape. Yellowstone lacks that iconic conical pointy edifice that we're so used to seeing when we look at the Cascades in our backyard. The reason for that is because Yellowstone's capable of super eruptions. So these are those paroxysms with long repose. These are those catastrophic, destructive, infrequent, but serious and voluminous events. So basically Yellowstone has produced this giant depression in the ground from its last super eruption because it just obliterated all remnants of a pointy edifice. So what you're looking at is a caldera formed from the most recent super eruption that has been subsequently filled with lava flows and then overgrown with trees and things like that. Now Yellowstone has had three of these caldera forming eruptions and to put the sheer volume of these events into context, I have the volume erupted from the Mount St. Helens 1980 eruption, which we know was totally devastating. But next to the volume of these super eruptions that Yellowstone is capable of, it looks absolutely minuscule. So you can imagine if something like this were to happen in our day, it would have serious consequences. I'm not here to fear monger. I'm just here to show you how cool this is. Now, specifically, I've been most interested in the Lava Creek Tuff, which is the most recent super eruption at Yellowstone. This is a map of the United States showing the ash distribution of those three super eruptions, and there's Mount St. Helens for uh, context. Notice that the Lava Creek Tuff basically blanketed the contiguous USA with ash when it erupted 631,000 years ago. And when we go to the park to collect some of this ash to study, you see these really impressive deposits with these little trees for scale. So like just behemoth mounds of these ash. 
So what we do is we go and collect this ash. We scrape it off of the side of a outcrop with a spatula. And the reason we want to study the ash is because imagine when ash erupts, it shoots into the air and it cools really, really quickly. So it's locking in all of that pre-eruptive information that we care about. And so we take it home to the lab and we separate out the crystal phases. Remember our mush has both melt and crystals. And because we're talking about highly evolved magmas, our crystal phases are alkali feldspar or sanidine and quartz. So these are the crystals we're going to be studying. So the first thing we do with these crystals is we slice them open and we image their interiors. So think about when you get an x-ray and you can see the bones inside your body. Cathodoluminescence is similar in theory, different in technique, where we can image the interior zones of a crystal. So you'll see different grayscale here. You'll see bright areas and dark areas. The bright areas, or bright CL, are areas that are rich in certain elements. So for quartz, they're areas rich in titanium. For sanidine, they're areas rich in barium and strontium. And then the dark areas are then depleted in those elements. So a few things we can learn already just from looking at images like this is one, you might notice that our crystals all share this really bright CL rim, right? This is what we call reverse zoning. What it reflects, oh, you're good. What, what it reflects basically is some sort of enrichment in the magma that is introducing these elements like titanium, barium, and strontium. And it's also representing a heating event. You'll also know there's a variety of zoning patterns. So some of our crystals are really simple. We have a simple core and a simple rim, but others are more complex, like that have oscillatory banding, so representing multiple events being recorded. You'll also notice that our cores have what we call resorption texture. So that's when our core has melted, followed by rapid rim growth that truncates that core boundary. So that's already telling us that some sort of melting event has occurred in our crystal record. Okay, so we've already learned a ton just from looking at these images. Now we can get a little more quantitative. So we use an electron microprobe using wave dispersive spectroscopy. And what we can do with that is we can analyze transects from core to rim and see how chemistry is changing across that transect. So here is a plot showing barium, that's our element of interest on the y-axis, and then orthoclase on the x, that's our major element chemistry. All these arrows in this plot represent different transects from different crystals. And you'll see this confirms that we have an increase in barium towards the outermost rim. And then we can translate this major element chemistry into temperature estimates that, well, so here I'm using feldspar liquid thermometry from Paterka's model. And this confirms that we do indeed see a heating event towards the outermost rim. We can do the same thing for our quartz. So again, we're gonna take a transect from core to rim. This time I'm only showing a single transect and I'm showing titanium on the y-axis and distance of our transect on the x. And from core to rim, we see a relative increase in titanium. Now we can translate this into thermometry again, and we can see that temperature is also increasing towards the outermost rim. So quartz and sanidine are both experiencing a drastic change in chemistry towards their rim, and they're also experiencing heating event. So our job now is to take all that evidence and put it into context of a magma process that happens under a volcano. So I have a Venn diagram here with three different processes on it. The first being temperature increase only, so just a heating event. The bottom left is what we call rejuvenation. So this is a process when we have deeply stored magma being injected into shallowly stored magma. And that often introduces less evolved compositions and also hotter material. And that can result in magma mixing and mingling. So we have different crystals and magmas coming into contact with each other. We have decompression, which is when magma moves from deep depths to shallow depths, which is associated with a drop in pressure and a change in solubility. So we get bubble formation. 
Now this is often associated with an increase in temperature due to latent heat, and it's also associated with a change in pressure. So all these processes have their own chemical fingerprint on our crystal record. So now what we're gonna do, let's lay out all the observations we've made and let's try to piece them into these processes, Venn diagram. So for example, the observation that we have titanium rich quartz rims, well, this can be explained by all three of these processes based on the partitioning behavior of titanium and quartz. So we know it's temperature and pressure dependent. So actually all three of these things can explain this observation, okay? Same is true for hotter quartz rims and hotter sanidine rims. These also can be explained by all three of these things because they all are associated with a heating and increase in temperature. So, so far this exercise is actually pretty useless, <laughs> but we will keep going. Okay, so we see resorbed cores in all of our crystals, both sanidine and quartz. That does not require any kind of pressure change. And so we're gonna put it in between rejuvenation and temperature. All right, we're starting to get somewhere. The fact we have multiple zoning patterns. So that is the simplest explanation for that is a rejuvenation where we have the introduction of different types of magmas and crystals coming together. But the smoking gun really is barium rich sanidine rims. So based off the known partitioning behavior of barium in sanidine, it is not temperature dependent. It is not pressure dependent. This is what my whole postdoc was about. So it's a smoking gun for rejuvenation because rejuvenation is the only way we can provide those barium and strontium atoms to our evolved magma. Okay, so this exercise has told us there's evidence for all three of these things. Nature is messy, that's totally okay. But we do see evidence leaning towards rejuvenation playing a very important role at initiating Yellowstone super eruptions. And I'll also note that we are ignoring the dynamics, the fluid dynamics and the structural dynamics required to really make a magma chamber fail, right? I have colleagues who are working on that, but the point, the important thing is we see rejuvenation before an eruption occurs. So it's likely playing an important role. Okay, that's nice. We have one of our questions checked off, but now we need to know how long does that process take? And is it within the resolution of our monitoring tools? Okay, so finally some diffusion chronometry. So here I'm showing a plot with barium and strontium. We know barium and strontium are abundant in our crystal, but something also very convenient for us is we know the rate at which they move through sanity, where barium is our relatively slow diffuser and strontium is our relatively fast diffuser. So we've collected these transects. We can compare their profiles to each other here I'm just smoothing out the data so it's easier for us to see. Now, based on the known diffusive behavior of these two elements, we would expect that strontium should be more relaxed in shape, right? It moves faster, so it should have moved farther along in this transect if it really is the result of diffusion. Because we don't see that, because barium and strontium are in fact the same width and the same shape, we conclude that these are not even diffusion profiles, they're growth profiles. So what that means is they're just, this profile is basically reflecting growth in a changing magma chamber. So barium and strontium are moving too slow to capture any significant diffusive relaxation. So we can't actually use diffusion chronometry here. That's okay. What we need is some superhero element that moves faster than both barium and strontium. Now, at the time that we published this study, this did not exist. So me and my PhD advisor just did a bunch of experiments and we made our own chronometer. So that's a different topic for a different talk. But magnesium happens to diffuse in two ways, which is very interesting. It can diffuse slowly, but it can also diffuse much faster than barium and strontium. So this is good. We can measure magnesium in our crystal and we can now calculate time scales. And when we do that, we get time scales as short as weeks. So let me just, just let that sit. <laughs> what that's saying is Yellowstone can switch from non-eruptive to eruptive as short as weeks. But hold on, 
This is just a really rough estimate. We also have a maximum estimate that that process can happen no longer than a decade. So from weeks, but no longer to a decade. That's a huge range in time, but it's the best we can do with this method. Regardless, this is interesting because we're learning that time scales between eruption and rejuvenation are on the scale of a human life. Maybe they're as short as weeks, maybe it's as long as decade, but we're getting somewhere. We've also learned that it's very crucial to use more than one element mineral diffusion pair when we're trying to make meaningful time scales. Okay, so we've addressed diffusion chronometry using crystals in a super eruption. Now let's move on to an explosive eruption of much smaller scale using melt diffusion chronometry. So with these evolved silicic magmas, a common observation that we see are diverse compositions being erupted together. So a beautiful example of this is Mount Mazama. Sorry, Nick, I have not been using this thing at all. <laughs> is Mount Mazama in Oregon, also known as Crater Lake, where we see this gorgeous zoned ignimbrite. So the bottom of this deposit is bright, brightly colored, which represents one magma composition. And the top represents a different magma composition. That's why you see a darker color. So this is implying some sort of heterogeneities that exist in the magma chamber prior to eruption. Now, another thing we like, or that we commonly observe in these types of eruptions are the presence of banded pumice. Now, banded pumice is basically direct evidence that multiple magmas are mingling with each other in the conduit right before eruption. So a great example of this is the rattlesnake tuff that erupted seven million years ago in Oregon. And then of course, the Nova Rupta eruption in Alaska in 1912. So one way to explain a simple explanation for why these heterogeneities exist is a zoned magma chamber, which was first proposed by Blake in 1981. So here I'm showing a very simplified cartoon of a zoned magma chamber. So we're going from chamber base to roof and you see distinct layers. Now each of these distinct layers have their own composition, their own density and their own viscosity, which depend on their water content, temperature, et cetera. Now, if this magma chamber were to erupt at a single vent, which I'm showing by this plume at the top, it was proposed by Blake and Ivy that the fluid dynamics that would follow would first tap the top of the chamber. And as soon as we start to evacuate material out of this magma chamber, we start getting a pressure gradient, which creates these flow lines which you see by these black arrows, these flow lines that then suck all of this magma from different parts of the reservoir and makes them mix or mingle in the conduit. So what this means is there's ample opportunity for magma mixing and mingling in the conduit upon ascent. Okay, this is really cool. What hasn't been done here is applying time scales to these processes. How long does it take for magmas to mingle in the conduit and erupt. So of course, that's what we're gonna do. So an excellent example of not only a density stratified magma chamber, but also a location that has banded pumice is the Rattlesnake Tuff in Oregon, part of the high lava plains. And here's uh, in dots, this is the Cascades for reference. Now, Anita Grunder and Martin Streck in 1997 did a beautiful job of characterizing five different rhyolites in the same eruption represented by these banded pumices. So here's a plot showing iron and silica on the x-axis. And you can see they have these distinct populations of rhyolites from the same eruption. So we have rhyolite A that's relatively more evolved than say rhyolite E. So from their observations, they concluded that the magma chamber beneath Rattlesnake Tuff once looked like this, where we have density stratified, we have chemically zoned, but we also have thermally zoned. So they perform some thermometry and learn that the bottom of the chamber is hotter than the top, which is something we would expect. So when we look at our banded pumices, I mean, these are just gorgeous hand samples. We see a variety of textures. So we see, again, some very simple hand samples that you can just see one type of magma mingling with the other. But then we also see more complex mixing happening or mingling happening.
I'll note here that dark areas are rhyolites that are rich in iron and light areas are rhyolites poor in iron. So the first thing we wanna do is characterize, like Anita and Martin did, which of these layers represents which rhyolite. So, and shout out to Marie Taycotch for helping me collect this data at Oregon State. Um, so what we do is we take thin sections of these boundaries, we characterize, okay, which one's which. So in this case, we have rhyolite A in contact with E. And we can put them in context with Martin and Anita's data shown in the blobs here. Now, of course, this sharp boundary is perfect to perform an analytical transect on and get a diffusion profile. So that's what I'm showing here. This is silica on the y-axis and distance of the transect on the x. And we're going from rhyolite A to rhyolite E, and we get a beautiful uh, diffusion profile. Now we're modeling both silica and barium diffusion in rhyolite. So we have departed from crystals. We are not diffusing crystals. We are diffusing in melt. So keep that in mind. Now we can calculate these time scales for multiple transects across multiple boundaries in our banded pumices. So the top panel I'm showing here is time on the x-axis in minutes. And on the top, I have just some markers for reference. So we have one minute to an hour to a day. And you'll notice for the mixture between A and E, so rhyolite A mixing with rhyolite E in the conduit, we're getting time scales on the order of hours. Now we can do the same thing for other mixtures that we observe, such as rhyolite A with D, B with E, and C with D. Now there could be more mixtures out there, but these are just the ones we most frequently observed. Well, now we can see that A and D is very similar to our top panel, both hours, but B and E and C and D are starting to get much shorter. We're on the scale of minutes now. So that's significant, that's an order of magnitude. So a simple explanation for why that could be is think about how different the viscosity between rhyolite A and rhyolite E is. So rhyolite A, recall, is our more evolved Rhyolite, it's poor in iron, so it's sticky, it's highly viscous. And rhyolite E is less evolved, so it's low viscosity. And to confirm that, we ran some calculations on each of these rhyolite groups at known water contents and known temperatures. And we do see that rhyolite A's viscosity is much greater than E. Okay, so what we think is happening here, the reason that these mixtures are taking such long time compared to these is that viscosity is rate limiting the magma from moving through the conduit and out. So anytime a magma mingles with A, it's going to be slowed down by its high viscosity. Alternatively, if we're messing with C and B, we can get out of there in minutes. So short ascent rates and driven by viscosity. Okay. So we've learned a few things during this talk, hopefully. Number one, we've learned that the rattlesnake tuff is a prime example of a zoned magma chamber with five distinct rhyolite groups, all varying in viscosity. We've learned that the ascent times for rattlesnake magmas are as short as minutes, as long as hours, and controlled by viscosity. So the more viscous layers will take longer to get out. Rejuvenation plays an important role in initiating super eruptions at Yellowstone. And super eruption initiation can occur on the scale of a human life, possibly as short as weeks, and definitely within resolution of our monitoring tools. And then lastly, it's important to use our chronometers with context as much as we can. And also it's important to use more than one chronometer in a given system for cross-checking. Now, before I conclude here, I just want to tell you or give a little plug for where this work has taken me and what's next. So our next diffusion chronometry venture is understanding what is the eruption initiation in our own backyard of Comacolchen, also known as Mount Baker in northern Washington. And this work is already on its way thanks to collaboration with Western Washington. So shout out to my collaborators here. Sue Dabari, Christina Walowski, and Dave Tucker. They are awesome to work with. Shout out to my graduate students who just got here 
but have already brought so much gusto and hard work to the project. It's been an absolute pleasure working with them. So this is Emily Yoder and Desiree Cunningham. And then lastly, shout out to CW undergraduate Catherine Jostin, who is such a natural talent, excelled in my volcanology class, and has been an awesome TA to work with. So point is, we have an awesome team assembled to figure out what's going on at Comacultion. OK, I will leave these here for you to simmer on. And I appreciate your attention. And thank you. I'll take some questions now. We have time for questions. And our speaker will be repeating your question so that the home audience can hear your question. I'm down to one camera now for whatever reason. So we're going to work with this one here. And we'll just go for it. Questions for Hannah, please. Kato. Uh, when you're looking at the different uh, element distribution curves, you were saying that MV or magnesium could be really slow or fast. Mm -hmm. is, that what, is that what accounts for the either weak or decayed scale? Yeah. So Cato asked, which is a great question, he asked, is the magnesium that diffuses both slow and fast, does that account for the time bracket we get? Yes, definitely. So. We used magnesium in the end to give us an upper bracket, so a maximum at which rejuvenation could be no longer then. But then we used its fast chronometer to give us a more realistic time scale, so weeks. So yeah, definitely, that's why we have a bracket time scale. Thank you. Yeah. Is defining why magnesium can be slower fast, is that what you don't want to get into? We can get into it. It has to do with which crystal site magnesium like gets itself into. You're going to learn all about it in mineralogy this quarter. <laughs> but it can behave in really different ways. Basically, it's a little desperate. <laughs> Talk more about it. Yeah, Joe. Uh, when you have the slide up for showing the crystal lattice and like how things would move slowly through it, yeah. that reminded me of like osmosis for things yeah. that are more human related. Mm -hmm. Would that be a good comparison? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. salt water moving through a squishy membrane is like metal moving through a hot, very pressurized, squishy membrane, but yeah. slower since it's metal. Absolutely, yeah. It's solid state movement. It's okay. diffusion, yeah. Great comparison. Oh, sorry, I didn't repeat the question. You're good. Uh, Job asked if osmosis was a fair analogy to diffusion in a crystal, and I would argue, yeah. And. Um, I'm excited to hear more about your culture work. Can you, can you give a little uh, more about what you're looking for and Oh, yes, yes. So Anne asked what uh, asked for more detail about the Coma Coltion Project and if there's student opportunities. So yes, the Coma Coltion Project is a multi-tiered collaboration with Western Washington where we want to understand, first of all, how is magma stored beneath the volcano and how does it erupt and how long does that take? Now, Coma Coltion has the most amazing lava flows that have so much chemical complexity to them that it's gonna take some time to detangle through, and that's what our students are doing. Desiree and Emily, thank you. Um, so yeah, our, our part of the story is time. Western's part of the story is where is it being stored? So we're kind of meeting halfway like that. And yes, there's always opportunity for awesome students. Um, I mean, Central, I've already started working with a lot of you and have enjoyed it so much. Um, but yeah, yeah, so undergraduate and graduate work is always on the table. Rhiannon. So I was looking last night a little bit on your website about um, demystifying magnetism, mm. and I'm just wondering what kind of conditions uh, make for a challenging um, recreation. Mm. I guess in terms of creating the chamber, or also analyzing the data you get from what is the most challenging. That's a great question. Rhiannon asked, because another part of my job is experimental petrology, so making magma in a lab. So Rhiannon asked, what's the most challenging part of that in terms of both the experiments and then analyzing the results? Whew, great question. Um, experiments equals failure. So let's just start there. <laughs> Get used to failing a ton. Um, number two, I think rhyolite compositions are really difficult to study because the kinematics in a rhyolite are so slow because they're viscous, it's sticky. It takes a while for things to move through that. Um, Analysis-wise, we are at the mercy of the precision of what tool we're using. So each instrument has its own pros and cons, so it depends on the, 
the chemical resolution you need, the spatial resolution. Yeah, I think the most difficult thing is probably spatial resolution. But yeah. Yeah, Nick. Patrick from home asks, so have these methods been used on Mount St. Helens, a recent event, ejected materials to affirm? Great question. So everyone heard that question? I guess they you did. Said it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, stay tuned for Tyler Schleter's talk, um, February 24th. He has applied this method to Mount St. Helens, I think domes, and also, is he, ta oh no, he's talking about, oh, his New Zealand stuff. <laughs> he has done it with Mount St. Helens, and he has done it with New Zealand. So stay tuned for Tyler Schleter's talk. Yeah. What is happening to the chamber itself? And this is a is it or is it does it maintain the structure of the world? Uh is it maintained simultaneously or has traveling to the world? <laughs> Great question. So the question is, what happens to the magma chamber after material evacuates? So yes, in theory, once we are removing material from the crust, we now have a void space. So in theory, material is rushing in to fill that empty reservoir. Or if the crust is weak, it will collapse and fall into that now empty volume. It depends on the scale we're talking about here. Um, so yeah, in theory, that's what Blake and Ivy were proposing, that these flow paths allow magma to be sucked up and then fill that void. Yeah. I got a couple more from, from our, our virtual viewers. Uh, Northwest Lifer asks, how big is Mount Baker's magma chamber and how far does it extend? I don't think we have a great sense of how big the current magma reservoirs are. That's going to require a lot of geophysical uh, tomography. So I don't know how to answer that, but mm -hmm. hopefully someone will answer that for us soon. A couple more I from the room. I think we had a question, right? Oh, and then we'll yeah. go to Robin here. Yeah. Go ahead. Of that material, so you get that banding on yeah. the outside. Yeah. How do you get that yeah. So the yeah, exactly. So the question was, how do you get that banding? Does the rate of ascent affect the way the banding looks? So that's really tough to know. So the complexities of mingling and mixing in the conduit are kind of unknown. But if you imagine if things are moving out really quickly, then maybe it just sucks up whatever's next to it, and then someone stayed back and they're still mixing and experience other things. It's, it's hard to say, but yeah, great question. And then Robin, I think, yeah. Hmm. Great question. So the question was, can diffusion chronometry help us predict the next Yellowstone super eruption? So what diffusion chronometry does for us is it tells us how long does it take for the volcano to flip from non-eruptive to eruptive from a rejuvenation event. So what that means is if we were to detect unrest at Yellowstone, so seismic activity, gas flux, deformation of the area, then that will tell scientists like, okay, if rejuvenation is occurring, then we have X amount of weeks or a decade, it depends. So it won't necessarily predict the next eruption, but it can assist us in mitigating hazard and evacuating people if the volcano were to show unrest. Yeah, so it's not a direct forecast predictive tool, but it can help. Yeah, great question. Yeah, David. How's the rate of rejuvenation across Yellowstone and journey across? Oh, through the Yellowstone hot. So the question is, has the rate of rejuvenation changed for the Yellowstone hot, hot spot? We don't know yet. So the diffusion chronometry is just starting to be applied to this type of volcano. So stay tuned. That's a great area for people to start working on. One more from home. This is just too good. Saber asks, does this method give any indication as to why some volcanoes are more explosive such as Krakatoa? I don't know if this method, oh, so the question, oh, I guess everyone heard the question, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if this method has been used on Krakatoa, um, but what it can tell us, not necessarily 
what's more explosive versus not. I mean, okay, so diffusion can give us an ascent rate of mm -hmm. magma. So if it's telling us that an ascent rate is much quicker than another one, that can reflect the type of explosivity of the eruption. So yeah, it could definitely be paired that way. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One more? Mm. Yeah, so the question was, does rejuvenation rate affect eruption style? Did I get that right? Okay, yeah, great question. So what the recharge rate will affect is if that volcano erupts or not. So it depends on the volume of the magma chamber. Imagine if we're ejecting a lot of mass into a giant volume, it's not really going to do anything. If the volume's small, that, and we inject a lot, then that can cause an overpressure to erupt. So yes, it does matter in that context, for sure. Can we thank Hannah one more time for this excellent talk? <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. Hope to see you again. Yeah. Have a good day. Thanks, Nick. Oh my God, you killed it. You killed it? I went too fast. No, it was perfect. Oh, I was like, you shaking my head? Of course I am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Feel free to visit with whom. You can just keep that on for now. Yeah. We need credits and a campy piano playout. Get working on that, Walt. <laughs> Okay, home viewers, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to hang out for a couple minutes. I want to test one thing with you. I um, want to give you this shot of our, our folks, get a sense of what it's like to be here. Uh, Hello. There's Jeff from Vinman's Bakery shaking Hannah's hand. That's Hannah's dad. And here comes Jim Gartrell. Come on over. I'm talking. You're on camera. You might as well. I saw you in the live chat. You were you were in the live great. chat. You were yeah. Wasn't she good? Yeah. Great. You can see where she's a great professor. Yeah. Those guys. Yeah. We're still on here. We're still on. I got I got I lost a camera in the, I lost that camera in the middle. That's never happened. So I want to see if I can. Uh, rejuvenate a, a, uh, I think viewers, I, I'm going to, let's give this a try. Oh, people are saying hi to you. Oh, hi everybody. <laughs> uh, what's the special, what's the special this week? Are you, do you have anything special that you're offering after the holidays or you're just trying to recover from? Well, that's when I go time. through the fridge and I look for leftover Russian tea, tea cake dough and things like that that we need to use up yeah, that we didn't get to at Christmas. So. And uh, there was definitely a call for rum balls. And when we make our rum balls, they're nuclear. They actually have rum in them. And you better be over 21 or we won't sell them to you. Oh, God. So that's what's on the horizon. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Before we sign off, can I test something with you? So the program is done. Hannah's busy visiting with folks. Um, had a great crowd, I'll tell you that. See you, man. Uh, let me let me see you, Jeff. Thank you. Let me, uh, so appreciate you tuning in, and I'll say goodbye uh, to some of you right now, I guess. But since I have you here, and I assume you can still hear me, of course, there's new wrinkles. I, the first live stream that I started, we didn't have any audio. And so I closed that live stream. I started another one. That's the, that's the one that we're currently in. And I'm having an issue. Hi, Jim. I, I like the two cameras set up. 
Oh, dude, those folks don't want to be on camera. Hang on, I got to bring this in closer. So, still have over 350 here. I'm going to show Hannah's slide right now to you. Sorry, you want to get through? Thank you for coming. And I'm basically going to try to close the camera operator and restart it and see if I can still, like I, I didn't want, so I lost one camera. I just had this one going. This is the wide shot. I didn't want to gamble and lose this camera too so that you wouldn't be able to see Hannah during live Q&A. But I'm going to show you a slide, try to shut off the cameras and start them back up and see if I can resuscitate that face camera. Uh, before we quit. Hope that makes sense to you. Even if it doesn't, here we go. So there's... Oh, Hannah. Okay, so Hannah just... Okay. Can you still hear me? I'm just curious now. Can you still hear me? You're just looking at the laptop screen of the speaker laptop. Okay. So now I'm closing this. Thank you. You bet. So I guess I'll narrate as I'm going. So now I'm, I'm quitting the cameras. Am I still live streaming? I think I am. Are we five by five right now, even though I quit the cameras? So this is this is an interesting test. Okay, so I'm still with you. And you're still seeing the speaker laptop. Okay, good. Thank you. Now I'm going to re, just talking to myself, trying to restart the cameras. And it's struggling to even open. Why? Oh, gosh. That must be. Why is it? It can't even, I can't even get going. So it's not the cameras themselves, it's this Insta360 link controller finally open. I still don't have face camera. Here's face camera, nothing. Here's wide camera. Wait, can you, yeah. Okay, let me, one more test then. So wide camera is still working. This is the wide camera that I use for the chalkboard. It's tomorrow morning. But maybe, maybe Hannah bumped something up there. I don't want to blame her. Let me go over and... I'm going to go try to see if I can reconnect. <laughs> Young Tim Miller, hello, hello. Face camera, can I see it now? I'll be with you in just a sec. I 
Sure, you bet. Thank you for helping. The red one. Thank you. Oh, you still have Mike. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm disappointed. I thought my OBS problems were gone uh, because of Matt helping me out getting a new version of OBS. But now I got camera problems. So I, I'm so relieved that the Hannah talk made it. Um, and I'm not going to start OBS again. We're done. But boy, I might have to test again tonight with the whole other setup because I need to make sure that I'm working. Okay, well, that's enough is enough. Thank you, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that talk with one camera. And I think it worked. Hope everything's going well. Thank you. I love you and goodbye.